Have you stopped attending church because you've been hurt by a so-called Christian? Are you tired of the hypocrisy, the gossip, and the slander? Are you ready to hear and are looking for the good news of God's kingdom? Jesus said you would know his disciples by the love that they show one to another. We're New Covenant Bible Church, and I guarantee we're different than any church you've ever experienced. I'm Pastor James Lacey, and I'd like to personally invite you to worship with us for the next 30 minutes. Luke chapter 9 and verse 57 The word says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. You ever had people tell you that? I got your back. I'm behind you 100%. Jesus got that all the time. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first, or allow me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go, bid farewell, which are at home at my house, them which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. It's important what we put our hands to. I like the way that last verse reads, verse 62 in the Message Bible. Jesus said, no procrastination, no backwards looks. You can't put God's kingdom off till tomorrow. Seize the day. Carpe diem, seize the day. Get it done today. But as I was studying this and looking this over and thinking about putting our hand to the plow or the scripture that says God would bless anything that we set our hands to, an old song came to my mind. And it was a song that the Happy Goodman sang. And it started off by saying, My hands were made to help my neighbor. And I began thinking about my hands as God began to question me, What are you doing with your hands? What are your hands up to? I believe it's a question he's asking the body of Christ today. Because people in the world aren't going to see God in a physical form. They're going to see him and get in relationship with him through the hands of his people and what we're doing. So I begin thinking, what are we doing with our hands? What can we do with our hands? And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Five things that hands can do. Do you know that our hands separate us from all the rest of God's creation? Do that. That opposable thumb separates you. The way your hand is structured separates you from the entire rest of God's creation. He's given us dominion over every kind of beast and every animal, over the earth, over everything in the sea and above the earth and under the earth. We have dominion. He expects us to be working with our hands. So let's look this morning, God's word, at five things hands can do. Everybody do that. Feels good, don't it? Number one, the first thing hands can do, hands can protect people from danger. We as God's people need to be looking for people who are in peril, who are facing danger, and use our hands to rescue them. Use our hands through the power and the authority of God to help people who are facing danger. In Genesis, the 19th chapter, if you read that entire chapter, you'll see that Lot was sitting at the gates of the city, Sodom and Gomorrah, and two angels came in. And he took those two angels to his house, and he said, I want you to come in and lodge with me for the night. And they said, no, we're going to stay out in the street. But Lot knew what kind of city he lived in. And he begged him and said, no, come on in the house. Come in the house with me. And he finally convinced them to come in the house. But after they got inside the house, the men of Sodom began beating on the door and saying, send them out to us. 
We want to hurt them. We want to abuse them. Send them out to us. And in Genesis 19, verse 10, as Lot went out the door and the men came close to attacking him, the word of God says, but the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. Do you know what I believe? I believe that in the year 2013, there are people facing danger. There are people whose lives are at risk, and I'm afraid that much of the body of Christ is sitting safe in the house of God doing nothing to help them. God has called us to open the door, reach outside the door, grab those people, drag them back in the house, shut the door, teach them of God's goodness, make disciples of them, send them back out into the highways and byways, and we will create a society that is able by our hands to help people who are in danger. You say, what are you talking about? We don't live in times like that. Oh, I agree with you. We live in worse times than that. I believe we live in a society that's worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Amen. I believe we live in a society where people have lost their minds. Parents Amen. are killing their children. Yep. People are strung out on drugs that cause them to act like zombies and eat other human beings. We are living in a sick, dark, depraved world. And unless we, as God's people, begin to reach out with our hands and say, I know you're in danger. I want to help you. I want to do all that I can to help you. Yes. Can you imagine if those angels would have said, I'm not opening that door. You don't know what's going on out there. Let him have Lot. He's on his own. He was stupid enough to go out there. I've heard people who claim to be Christians look at those who are down and out, those who are facing danger, and say, well, it's their own fault. If they hadn't made those decisions, they wouldn't be out there. I'm not going to get out there and wreck my life. Oh, thanks be to God that yes. Jesus didn't think like that. Yes. Thanks be to God that Jesus didn't look at us yes. lost in our sin and say, I'm not going to do it, Father. I want this cup to pass from me. Send 10,000 angels. Rescue me. I don't care what happens to humanity. No, he looked down and said, I'm going to use my hands. I'm going to rescue them. I'm going to reach down even though they don't deserve it. If we as God's people would be willing to reach out to the people that we don't think deserve it. They don't deserve our time. They don't deserve our finances. They don't deserve our attention. If we would reach out to those people and say, we're going to get our hands dirty. We're going to reach down to where you are and we're going to pull you out of the danger that you're facing. There are people who need help in this very community. It is up to us as God's people yes. to help them. Yes. Open the door. I believe the door to the church needs to be open. Yes. Amen. God shut the door to the ark. I don't read anywhere where he shut the door to the church. Amen. There are too many churches whose doors are shut. They're inclusive. They're inbred. It's bless us for and nothing more. And if you're not just like us and you don't believe just like us and you don't look just like us, then we can't fellowship with you. No, I believe we need to do what these angels did and throw the door open yes, and reach outside the door and snatch people in to the kingdom of God. Amen? amen. I want to be a, a snatcher. Amen? I want to snatch people out of peril. Amen. I want to get the person that's going down for the third time and they're not going to resurface if somebody doesn't help. I want to be the one that reaches down and pulls them out and says, if God helped me as sorry as I am. You know, I believe that's one problem in the church. We get saved, sanctified, full of the Holy Ghost, and we forget who we were and where we came from. Amen. We're all just a bunch of sorry sinners. Amen. Old piece of dirt that God formed in his likeness Amen. and breathed the breath of life into. He saved me when I had no use to anyone else in the world. And if he was willing to reach out and rescue me from danger, I'm going to commit my life and my ministry to doing the same thing for other people. Amen? Amen. Number two, the second thing that hands can do, do that again. <laughs> hands can bring deliverance to people in bondage. Do you know there are people all over this great city of ours who are in bondage? They're in bondage to drugs. They're in bondage to alcohol. They're in bondage to pornography. They're in bondage to all manner of evil. We've got an enemy. The Bible said we have to be wary and be vigilant and know that Satan goes to and fro as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. There are men, and we say men and women, there are little children, 8, 9, 10 years old, who are in bondage to sin. 
horrible, evil things have happened in their lives. And I can't be content to come here and sing our happy songs about God turning it around and going out and looking at them and not having compassion. No, I pray God use my hands to help those in bondage. Help me to be the one that brings deliverance. Moses had led the Israelites out of Egypt. Exodus 14, they were at the Red Sea. Between the devil and the deep blue sea. The Red Sea was ahead which they would drown in and behind them came Pharaoh and all his men and his chariots. And they began to cry out to God. And God looked at his man Moses and said, why you stand here crying? Tell him to go forward. And in Exodus 14, 21, the word says, and Moses stretched out his hand. Are you willing to stretch your hand out well, I've never been involved in drugs. I've never tasted alcohol. I've never lived that life. I don't know how to communicate with those people. Those people, are you kidding me? The great I am came in flesh to this earth and reached down to us. He didn't look at us as those people. He looked at us as his people and he stretched his hand out. Moses stretched his hand out over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. Why? Because one man was obedient when God said, stretch out your hand. We can stand with our hands in our pockets. We can stand with our hands in the air. We can sit with our hands folded. But I believe God is calling us to a higher level. He's saying, stretch out your hand. Reach out your hand. Whoa! Do something to touch those who need to be touched by the love and the mercy and the grace of God. Let's use our hands to deliver people from bondage. Amen. I want to go down to the jail and get the people out. I want to get those who are down on skid row. I want to get those whose lives are out of control, who are on the verge of death because of the things that they've done to their body through drugs and alcohol, those who are in bondage, yes. those who have Satan, those who Satan has sown up, and they see no hope and no way out. By the hands of the body of Christ, we're going to begin to stretch them out. Amen? We're going to stop holding them behind our back like a funeral director standing next to a casket. We're going to reach our hands out and say, if you're in bondage, if you need help, there's a group of people at New Covenant Bible Church who want to help you. We want to stretch our hand out. You know what I think when I read that verse about Moses stretching his hand out? I think about someone who is drowning, someone who needs help. And you reach your hand over the side of the boat. And you stretch and you stretch and you stretch and you stretch and you reach until you finally get a hold of them and you clasp their hand and pull them into safety. That's what Moses did at the Red Sea. That's what God is calling his people to do in the year 2013. Reach your hand out. Stretch your hand out. Help those in bondage. Number three, the third thing that hands can do. Come on, Art. You play the piano. You're good at that. My wife interprets. She'll do that to me across the room, and I have no I just say. I've agreed to things that you don't want to know about. The third thing hands can do, hands can cause dramatic changes in the world. In the book of 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, Elijah called for all the prophets of Baal, 450 of them, the prophets of the groves, 400 of them, to meet him on Mount Carmel. He was going to call on Jehovah. They were going to call on their gods, which were not gods. And the one that answered by fire would be declared the Lord. Jehovah showed up, showed out, consumed the altar, consumed the bullock, licked up all the water in the trench. At that point in history, it had not rained for three years. That's dramatic. If we don't get rain for a month in the summer, we have drought. They begin to ration water. You can't water your yard. You, you can't do this or that or the other when it comes to water. Three years, rain had not fallen upon the face of the earth. 
But after God showed out at Mount Carmel, Elijah called his servant and said, Go tell Ahab to get himself down because I hear the sound of abundant rain. Ahab came down, and the Word of God says that Elijah put his head between his knees. He bowed. He got down. And he put his face down and he cried, God, do something about this dramatic situation that we're in. We've had no rain. Send the rain. And he called his servant and said, go see if it's raining. And his servant went out and come back and said, no, it's not raining. And Elijah put his head between his legs and prayed again, God, we got something dramatic going on here. We need your help. Go see if it's raining. And the servant went out and come back and said, no, it's not raining. And Elijah put his head between his knees again and prayed, God, I need you to show up. And the third time he told his servant, go and see if it's raining. And he went out and said, no, it's not raining. And the fourth time he bowed his head and it wasn't raining. And the fifth time he bowed his head and it wasn't raining. And the sixth time he bowed his head and it wasn't raining. And the seventh time when he prayed, he said, go see if it's raining. And his servant come back and said, I don't see any rain. He said, but I see a little cloud coming up out of the sea about the size of a man's hand. That servant saw no significance in that little cloud the size of a man's hand. The world looks upon us as God's people and they see nothing of significance in us. Oh, I see a little group that preaches and slings snot and slobber and prays at the altar and acts crazy on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday. Nothing significant about that. But Elijah said, tell Ahab he better get going because the rain's going to prevent him if he doesn't. And that little cloud that appeared as a man's hand caused the entire sky to turn black. And a torrential downpour began to fall. And that dry, parched ground that had been through three years of drought was changed dramatically. I'm asking you this morning, do you know someone who has something dramatic going on in their life and they need help? Will you stretch your hand out? Will you say, here's one hand, it's just one hand, but if you're willing to take it, I'll stretch it out and expect God to use it and I'll help you. When you're going through dramatic circumstances, it shapes your life. Amen. You'll remember the dramatic moments in your life. Amen. There's many moments you're not going to remember. I was thinking back about school the other day. It's just a blur to me. I don't remember many, many of my teachers or what the lessons were. I don't remember a lot of stuff from my childhood. But there were some very dramatic moments in my life, Brother Miller, that stand out when I stop to think about the 46 years that I've lived. Three years without rain was drama. But because that little cloud the size of a man's hand came up out of the sea, the entire earth received a downpour. Oh, I like what the prophet Joel said. In the last days, God was going to pour his spirit out on everybody, on all flesh, upon our sons and our daughters. How's he going to do it? He's going to do it because some men and some women and some boys and some girls raised their hands and began to call out to him. We're living in a drama-filled world. And when people's lives are filled with drama, the only thing that will help is the power of God. Yes, amen the great I am, the creator of this universe and everything in it. Hello, I'm Pastor James Lacey from New Covenant Bible Church in Tulsa. If you're looking for a church that's not too old fashioned or too progressive, my wife Vanessa and I would like to invite you and your family to come worship with our family. We offer anointed preaching, dynamic praise and worship, and outstanding youth and children's programs. So check out our website, ncbctulsa.org for our service times. And watch Pastor's message Sundays, 10 p.m., right here on KWHB TV 47. I'm going to tell you a dramatic moment, amen. I'm going to break the mood here a little bit. When we first started pastoring at the funeral home, we started this church less than three years ago in a funeral home with 17 people. Remember that, Darren? Darren was with us. Karen, where's she at? Karen was with us. Amen. They were with us. They're at the funeral home, 17 people. We'd been going a few months, 
And I got a call from a pastor that I did not know down in southern Oklahoma. And he said, I want you to come and preach for me. I said, praise God, I'm going to come and I'm going to bring my family. We loaded up in our big SUV. We were driving along. We had to stop like we always do and get something to drink. The kids always want a bug juice or a grape juice or something that will stain your clothing. And I'm against it. But, you know, Vanessa's an indulger. She gives them what they want. So Dalton got his juice, and I was wearing a light gray suit. We were about an hour away from the church, which we'd never been to. He couldn't get his juice open. He handed it to me. Dad, open my juice. I was pulling the lid off, and I squeezed it, and it came out all over my pants. I said, what now? She said, I've got a bottle of water. I said, what are you going to do? We're an hour away from the church. She said, just take your pants off. I said, woman, have you lost your mind? She said, just take your pants off. She said, it's all just the family. She said, take your pants off, and I'm going to use this water, pull over. I said, how are you going to dry them? She said, I got this. I got this. So I pull my britches off and give them to her, and we pull over, and she soaks them down with a bottle of water, scrubs them with baby wipes, gets all the stains out, rolls her window down, puts my pants in the window, rolls the window up, says, go! I'm driving. We got about 40 minutes now. Those pants are flapping in the wind. I'm thinking, what a genius of a wife I've got. We drove a few minutes longer, and she's resting and sleeping. The kids are all playing on their phones and doing what they do, and there was a fly in the car. I was trying to get him over to my side of the car where I could put him out the window. We were going across the North, we were going across the North Canadian River Bridge, 70 miles an hour. I hit the button to roll my window down and shoo that fly out, and I hit the wrong button and rolled hers down. And <laughs> I said, oh, my Lord. She said, what? I said, my britches are gone. <laughs> Off the bridge. I said, we are 30 minutes from this church. There's not a store between here and there. She said, call the pastor. I said, you call the pastor. This was your idea. <laughs> she called the pastor's wife, said, oh, we've got drama going on in the car. She said, what's going on? And she explained it to her, and she said, I will meet you. She said, pull around the back of the church. There's an evangelist quarters there. She said, I'll bring a pair of my husband's britches. Nobody will know the difference. said, what color is he wearing? She said, he's wearing light gray. She said, he's got plenty of light gray suits. I said, praise the Lord. We pull up at the church about five minutes till service time, pull around back. My wife runs in, runs back out. I'd never met this pastor. <laughs> I'm six foot four, and my slacks were 34 in the waist and 36 in the length. She brought these pants out. The tag may as well have said property of Oral Roberts Tent Revival Association because that man <laughs> they were a 60 if they were if they were big. I said, "How in the world am I supposed to do this?" She said, "Just put the pants on. Let's go minister." I put the pants on and girded them up with my belt. She said, he could be watching. <laughs> I'm sorry, brother. I girded those pants up. There was this much material sticking out of the back of my coat. And while I was 34 this way and 36 this way, he was 60 this way and 28 this way. So his pants left three foot out the back and we're about that high.
And I walked in the church shaking hands and hugging necks. Glory to God. We're here to have service. It was one of the most dramatic and embarrassing moments of my ministry life. But do you know what? Hmm? The Holy Ghost fell. People laid their hands on me because they saw the shape I was in. <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be funny. I'm trying to be sincere now. I'm trying to shift gears here, people. Stick with me. They didn't laugh at me to my face. <laughs> They prayed for me, they laid hands on me, and I got up, and you know how I like to walk when I'm preaching, but I preached that entire sermon like an independent fundamental Baptist. I never moved from behind the pulpit that night. <laughs> but the Holy Ghost fell. When I was in a situation that I believe my ministry was over, Nobody's ever going to call me back again. God's people reached their hands out to me in mercy and loved me through it. And God's hand fell in that situation. And just like that man's hand, that little cloud that came out of the sea, the very dramatic situation in my life that caused me turmoil, God showed up and turned it around just like we sing about. I said all that to say this, no matter what you're going through today, Find somebody that loves you Amen. and say, just put your hand on me. Just reach out to me. No matter how bad it looks, right now, at this point in history, just love me. And I've got news for you. Your life will be changed and the lives of the people who stretch that hand towards you will be changed. Amen? All right, we've got to move on. Number four, the fourth thing that hands can do. Hands can bring healing to hurting people. Right. 19th chapter of Acts, the Word of God says, And God wrought, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. By the hands of Paul, people's lives were changed. By the hands of Paul, people were healed. By the hands of Paul, people were delivered. By the hands of Paul, people were set free. Yes. God is expecting us as his people to stretch our hands out and allow him to send the power to help hurting people who need healing in their lives. We want to thank you for worshiping with us today. We trust that you were touched by the message and received a blessing. I'd like to invite you to come down and meet the church family in person and worship with us. If you have a prayer request or would like to drop us a letter, you can do so by writing to Pastor James Lacey at P.O. Box 9716, Tulsa, Oklahoma. The zip is 74157. Until next week, the same time, God bless.